Hey everyone, so as you probably know at this point, I for one love horror. And one of the things that's so important for me in a horror setting is that of the setting itself. Most often horror like Friday the 13th or the Halloween series takes a setting we're all familiar with and that's used as the basis for whatever the scare is. And then several of my favorite horrors like the 1982 movie The Thing take a setting that we can sort of relate to like people at a research base and then use that for whatever cosmic horror comes out of it. But I think it's especially interesting whenever a horror series creates an entirely unique world that is so visceral and outside of our realm of understanding that just the thought of it in itself is enough to creep us out. And today I want to bring one of those horrors to you, Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Now this was originally started by an artist known as Trevor Roberts who goes by Strange Vehicles on Reddit. And specifically, it began within the subreddit r slash world building. It began as a sort of creative exercise of seeing how intricate or heavily put together of a world you could make. However, as you could see, Trevor went way beyond the average or what was required of him and instead created this super expansive universe. That being of a now defunct national park that was made out of a living cave that is potentially a giant hundreds and hundreds mile long creature underneath the earth itself. Not only that, but Trevor was able to tell this story through a series of brochures and park guides that look like they would be standard of any national park. So there's not only creativity with the world itself, but also the manner in which information is given to us. So today I want to go through some of the details and break down this entire ARG that Trevor has crafted. However, there's no way that I'm going to be able to get to every single minute detail as cool as they all are. So I'm going to leave a link to the original website where all of this information is cataloged for you to find, as well as the artist's Patreon and subreddit, because I'm telling you, this is some wild stuff and you really need to check it out. And you know what else you should check out? Today's sponsor that allows you to save money while shopping for free. Because if you're like me, nowadays online shopping is pretty much all that you do. Like if there's a specific item that I want, I just find it online for the best deal and have it sent to my house. And now those best deals can get even better with Honey. Honey is the online tool that scours the internet for the best promo codes available and helps you save money on your order. Being the number one shopping tool in America, it is seamless and easy to use. You can get Honey on your computer for free in just two easy clicks. Then all you gotta do whenever you're at checkout is hit the apply coupon option, wait a few seconds as Honey scours the internet to find the best promo codes, and then apply it to your order. And if Honey finds a working code, your price will drop with no extra effort to you. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've been ordering pizza with friends and I'm about to do it over the phone and they go, no way, let me do it on the laptop. Because whenever they get to the checkout, Honey pops up, they hit apply, and then we get our pizza for $10 off. And it just doesn't stop there. Everything from shoes to tech to video games or whatever have you, Honey does its best to find codes that save you money at no charge to yourself. Take it from me as someone who's used it before, there's nothing more satisfying than whenever you're at a checkout to have your friend pat you on the shoulder and go, hey, you want to get $7 off that? And of course I do. <laughs> and just saving money as easy as can be. Haha, <laughs> get it? B, honey, honey, anyway. So all that you have to do is go to the link in the description at joinhoney.com forward slash windagoon to immediately put it on your computer and just start saving cash. Once again, that is joinhoney.com forward slash windagoon and I ask that you please use my link because it lets them know that I sent you and it helps me and it helps the channel and I really appreciate it. So thank you all so much for watching. Thank you so much to Honey for sponsoring the video. It means the most. I hope that you check it out. I hope you use the link in the description I hope you all have a great day and we are back to the video which is again two feet this way so just cut back so without further ado we are going to go ahead and break down the horror of the flesh pit 
but first of all, and as always, thank you for watching. So the story of Mystery Flesh Pit National Park is told very non-chronologically. Basically, Trevor will release these incremental posters and pictures that allow us to paint a picture of the world together. So lucky for you all, I already did all that and believe I can track down what the first references to the park, or at least, you know, on a timeline, what the first references to the park can be. We'll break down more of the actual details of what the pit is like, as well as the quite literal anatomy of it later. But right now, we're just getting an introduction to how this thing came to be. In our first letter from James Jackson, also known as Jim Jackson, which we'll see more of later, he writes in a letter to Mr. Colton Fleming explaining the finding of this cave itself. The letter reads, Dear Colton, now you know more than most how I may be prone to hyperbole on occasion, but those Whitmer boys that called on Monday are on to something amazing. I mean really truly amazing. This isn't any mineral deposit, Colton. At least not like anything I've seen. I went ahead and sent some samples for you and Chris to start looking at. I didn't think you all would believe me if I didn't. This thing that those old boys found is some kind of organic deposit that must go down at least five or six hundred feet by my reckoning. Not a fungus either. This thing breathes and makes sounds same as any other creature and it bleeds. God how it bleeds. Colton, it's a mess out here. John and some of the others think it might be something from outer space. Most of the hombres we brought out to start the excavation call it Diablo de Bajo and are real weary of going too close to what we figure must be the mouth of this thing. Right now, I don't think I care what it is or where it came from. I'm an oil man, and I think we're onto something real big out here. Once you and Chris start looking at these samples, go ahead and give Lenny a call to send out his crew, and make sure they bring at least four excavators. Pay them whatever they ask to make it fast. Also, there's a card in here for a fella in Carlsbad with some pretty heavy duty spelunking gear. Pay him whatever he wants to get here by Friday or Saturday. I'll call Beverly to have her put out other jobs on hold for the next three weeks, but you should remind her anyway. We need to move real fast on this. Dale Whitmer already left this morning to find someone in Gumption to come take some photos. It'll be a circus once that happens. God help us if the feds come out and lock it down. There's something about this thing that's important, and I don't want to see something this special get in the hands of some game warden. Regards, James Jackson of Jackson Surveying Incorporated. So as you can see there, it seems that just a normal mining operation or oil drilling operation came across this giant creature hidden underground. Now Jackson was right as to say that this thing underground, whatever they walked into was actually the mouth of it. Because as we're gonna see in a little bit, this thing has entire nervous systems, muscles, and stomach components and it seems that this agape opening is in fact the mouth of this creature. Now, before we get into a lot of the details or my favorite part, the tourism surrounding the flesh pit, I need to go ahead and read the second letter from Jackson as to make sense of this. Dear Colton, things are really starting to take off down here. At around three or so last night, we broke a new depth record of 1800 feet vertical descent from the maw. It's a damn shame you and the other folks are so spooked by this pit. To be down there in it really is something else. Now don't misunderstand, I'm not saying it's easy. God almighty is it tough getting around down in its gullet and such. A man's gotta have an iron constitution or a mighty thick skull and lucky me the good lord has seen fit to bless me with both. Some of the boys here have rigged up scuba gear and we've been able to squeeze around down there with some effort. Giant muscles, giant bones, entered so big you could drive a trailer truck through. Strange critters scuttling around in the dark down there too. Big bugs and germs and worms and other queer things that you wouldn't believe. Some kind of crab thing the size of coyote crept out a week and a half ago and we caught it crawling around the feed trailer. I got a good look at it before one of Dale's boys shot at it and it skittered away. We had the funeral for the third roustabout to pass away this month on Tuesday. 
The papers are already talking gossip more than I like, and I'm hopeful that Bill and the other attorneys can keep the vultures and the feds at bay. People don't understand until they've seen it and been down inside it, Colton. We're pioneers and explorers here. This is good work. This is God's work. Nobody knows what this mystery pit is or what it eats, or how long it's been here. We need some guys with real smarts, not oil men. Doctor, scientist, and good decent folk who would have nothing to do with us. I'm mighty glad that you've taken responsibility for holding down the fort back home while I'm out here playing the cowboy. You're a good man, Colton. The kind of quality individual they don't make anymore. Maybe I'm hoping I can find some of that goodness myself someday. Maybe down in the belly of this beast. Give Samantha and the baby my regards. Jim Jackson. P.S. There's a company out of Fort Worth that I've called up to help with the exploration. I attached their car to this letter. Give their geologist a call and let them know the details. I'm told they're very good at what they do. And attached we see a business card for the Anodyne Deep Earth Mining Company. Now Anodyne's gonna come up a lot because they're pretty much responsible for everything that happens after this point. So the pit was discovered in 1973. And as Jackson talked about in the letters, very quickly the local populace as well as the authorities began to grow interest in it because Duh. And one of the most interesting things about this story is the immediate rush of consumerism that happens surrounding the pit. See, initially, it becomes a competition of what certain groups are going to do with it. But through what you can kind of pick up on as some government influence on Anodyne's behalf, they managed to get the park sanctified as a national park. What that means is that the park itself is treated in the same way the Smokies or Yellowstone would be treated. As in, it cannot be destroyed by any newcomers coming in. However, it can be hosted by different companies like restaurants or lounges. And more importantly, Anodyne maintains access to the resources. So the main questions going in at this point is how big is the pit and what exactly did they do to it? And measurements of tissue as far down as they could see initially are about 30 kilometers, which again probably isn't even close to how deep it actually is and charts like this one that have the original surveyor's mark show that they mapped it out down to about 4,000 feet so in other words it's uh it's pretty big and if you'll pay attention to that part in the second letter people are not the only creatures alive inside of the living cave itself as a matter of fact as you can see on the major parasitic fauna chart there are several massive creatures that people have to worry about like for example the abyssal sopapod that's probably not how it's pronounced but whatever sopapod when i initially saw this i was like oh well what is that like like a really big beetle like that and then I was reading in another entry about how they eat people and can grow up to 20 feet long. So in other words, a small school bus that eats people. Oh my gosh. Which would mean all these other creatures you can see there are probably much, much bigger than people are. Also beneath several of these posts is a sort of explanation that goes into more detail around whatever's being discussed. So underneath the bug chart, we can see in the description that it reads, this chart and many others like it were produced by Park Service as an educational tool for use in classrooms, museums, and universities. Popular among natural history enthusiasts, the illustrations featured on these posters were the result of an intensive expeditions and surveys into the mystery flesh pit. While visitors are almost certain to encounter common fauna, such as the myriad of macrobacteria subspecies, many organisms such as the Venice shamble and the abyssal sopapod, probably pronouncing that wrong again, tend to evade trails and high traffic areas, making them difficult to spot. As a practical tool, these illustrations were useful in training wildlife management rangers and proper firearm techniques for safely dispatching a dangerous organism. For this reason, the designers of this and other charts attempted to represent the scale of the organisms in relation to each other as accurately as possible. So if you're going into the pit, you better be strapped. And also, like, look at all the detail in these different designs. Like, for example, the lesser sopapod, which looks like a giant tendril shrimp thing, and then the gastric bristle worm, which is 
huge and terrifying. And there's some more specific entries about some of the lesser known or lesser seen ones. Like for example here with the evolution of the amorphous shame pamphlet which is presented as a sort of brochure for people taking a hike through the trail, you can see the life cycle of something that is believed to be an ancient descendant from a weasel that over time crawled into the cave and slowly lost so many traits of itself it eventually just became a blob of organs that crawls inside of crevices in the flesh walls of the cave itself and just like absorbs the nutrients which is uh. and as you'll remember me mentioning earlier the flesh pit itself became a national park hiking and all which means as pictured on maps like this that show the orifice or mouth of the pit as well as an interior trail map people would go on these very long excursions walking through the innards of this creature and people could visit such amazing sites such as the northern bronchial forest which is the sort of lungs of this creature the amniotic thermal springs which is something we are going to talk about in a minute the gastric sea which is digestive enzymes or the fondue village which is bone marrow so large you can walk inside of it which is a very comforting thought and some of the dangers that hikers through the park and i'm going to continue using park but you know by park i mean giant flesh underground monster thing we can see in the wildlife safety pamphlet some of the things people hiking would have to worry about like with the introduction it says your visit to the mystery flesh pit can be a most pleasurable and rewarding experience or it can be a time of vexation distress or even tragedy much depends on how you and your family observe these simple guidelines and avoid designated hazards. Take a minute to read these simple but important safety rules, then go on to a pleasant park experience. I also want to mention all of these pamphlets, as well as everything that I'm going to mention that's been industrialized within the park, has been done by the Anodyne Corporation. Visitors and wildlife within the Mystery Flesh Pit often frequent the same areas within the park. It is likely that park wildlife and visitors will encounter one another, but by remaining calm and following the basic advice of experienced venterio biologists, you increase the odds of a positive outcome, outcome for both yourself and the wildlife. All visitors who partake on self-guided excursions beyond reinforced and enclosed trails within the mystery flesh pit are required to attend an orientation at the lower visitor center. During this orientation, a park ranger will inform you about areas that are closed to visitors due to high fauna activity or recent wildlife human encounters. It is important to be aware when camping and hiking within the Mystery Flesh Pit to avoid wildlife foraging areas, chymal deposits, gastric bladders, surface wildlife carcass mounds, etc. So not only do you have to worry about the giant bug things that are essentially this creature's immune system, but you have to worry about the creature itself digesting you. We'll talk about that in a minute, but a final thought on encountering these things. It says at the end of the pam pam pamphlet, if you see flora or fauna within the park and it does not appear to notice you, back out of sight and change your course. Move out of the area or quietly observe at a safe distance without approaching or otherwise disturbing it. Disturbance is evident whenever wildlife change their behavior because of you. If it stops eating and looks up, slash raises its antennas, or secretes scent enzymes, or begins making territorial clicks while trying to locate you, you are too close. While many life forms within the pit seem to be tolerant of human presence at a distance further than 200 yards, each creature is different. Use telephoto lenses and endoscopes where possible. Allow migrating bacterial colonies to pass by your camp undisturbed. If you have made sure that the wildlife is aware of your presence so it is not surprised and have kept all your gear under your direct control, allow any organism you encounter to travel unhindered. You may just be afforded the opportunity to safely observe these amazing creatures in their natural environment. Yeah, these giant 20 foot tall shrimp things that eat people just don't panic and just let them walk by your camp. Which I guess, like, their resistance to gunshots is mentioned earlier, but I guess that's all you can do. Also, not only mentioned here, but in other places, it seems all the creatures within the pit itself is blind, which makes sense because the, you know, 
before we opened up the hole into the mouth of this thing it was entirely underground and everywhere throughout the pit is just pitch black so none of these creatures use eyesight it's all sound and pheromone tracing so remember how just a second ago i said that the pit or park itself can eat you they know that can happen because it's happened on one of the deeper trails through the park itself you can come across something known as the circus clown chymus the description of it reads as though it may look like a colorful ice cream birthday cake covered in a glazed frosting this calcified formation is anything but festive in 1976, a group of performers accidentally fell into the upper maw of the entry orifice. While the soft flesh of the pit throat somewhat cushioned the performer's fall, the unexpected dilation of an epiglottal fold allowed them to slide down into a then unreinforced area of the pit. Rescue personnel were able to locate the performers inside a digestive sack a few hours later. But by that time, all 50 stunts people had already begun being digested by the pit. Rescue personnel cut them out, correctly guessing that many were still alive. An experimental ant acid spray was discharged on top of the gooey, shrieking mound. But it was too late. Instead of reducing the acidic effects of the partially digested bodies of the performers, the experimental compound flash calcified into the multicolored formation that you see in front of you. Though hauntingly beautiful, the circus clown chymus is a somber reminder of why it is always important to observe all safety instructions and to always stay on the marked trails while visiting the interior of the mystery flesh pit. So. A group of clowns were performing above the flesh pit itself because people are going to be stupid. And then 50 of them fell into the pit, couldn't be located for hours, and when they did locate them, they were trapped inside of a digestive like enzyme sack, like a giant lysosome. And then when they cut them out, they were all melted together and screaming and shrieking and then froze like that and they just left it there. <laughs> and then they had the audacity to call it hauntingly beautiful, which no, it's not, it's just haunting. But despite all of this, people still visit the park. And while reading this, at the first moment, I'm like, that's dumb, they wouldn't. And then I thought for three seconds and I'm like, yeah, they probably would. <laughs> so once Anodyne had the initial park opened up or at least the central part of it, that's when the advertising began. Such as this poster for the park itself, which says discover verdant forest, majestic scenery, and cosmic terror, enjoy legendary trout fishing, geotonic carnal moans, broken philosophy, backcountry hiking, and camping. I love the broken philosophy because yeah, where's your God now? A lot of the supplemental material you can read on your own is about how it was hard for businesses to at first sell the idea of the flesh pit because you know people were reasonably afraid so one of the things they did was they came up with this mascot called caver coop who would do these animated sort of looney tune style films talking about going through the cave and why it's really not something to be afraid of in a sort of propaganda technique and they would have several events and some catered towards children like caver coop spooky halloween carnival where among the activities for children to perform is haunted hay rides, campfire stories, safe trick-or-treating, and blood. <laughs> because if there's one thing this giant cave has a lot of, it's blood. It's interesting with these, a lot of the brutality that occurs behind the scenes, just for all of the happy sort of national park vibes that are put on the display. Like for example, in one letter called Experiences of a Flesh Pit Mine Worker, a mine worker writes to a child telling them what it's like to work for anodyne in the flesh pit where essentially a full crew of people work outside of this giant mining rig that works as a boring machine cutting through the cave and by cutting through i don't mean in the way that like other things dig through rock i mean quite literally it's hacking and slashing and there's blood everywhere and it's insane in describing to the boy how the rig works he says ideally the rig cuts as it goes leaving a burnt cauterized path through the meat while also crushing and processing any minerals it runs through. In the real world, the pit isn't uniform, 
and you end up running into all kinds of obstacles requiring interventional solutions or the brass up top decide that they don't want you just cutting through certain parts of the anatomy. So you suit up and get out ahead of the rig to poke and prod and pry at a walking pace. Eight hours a day for weeks at a time. Rigs have a big hydraulic arms that reach forward and push, lift, and splay open organs or muscle bundles before us roustabouts would go in and suck up or hose out any blood, cut tendons, cauterize tissue, rinse, and repeat. So while you're thinking that whatever's going on may harm this creature, um, this thing is so big it's the equivalent of having like a zit basically everything that these people are doing and as you can see from diagrams like this with the park trail engineer um some of the places inside of the pit are so tight or so inhospitable because you're in a giant immune system basically that you have to wear these full body suits and put these stints up everywhere that you go so that the muscles don't collapse in and crush you to death. And vehicles like the Park Ranger Utility Vehicle shows you what you need in order to traverse through this myriad of guts. I also like a lot of these smaller touches that he puts into the world building, like for example, this necklace that was taken off of a mine worker that says, a flesh pick worker's prayer. Each day I descend into the deep, cutting meat to earn my keep. Pray to my Father in heaven above that I return to those I love. If somehow death and I should meet, as even the flesh pit needs to eat, I want my loved ones to be sure that in Jesus' arms I am secure. And it's an interesting way to combine these West Texas vibes of which the pit itself takes place in with this horrific cosmic Lovecraftian horror that the authors built. And it is dangerous. You can see in several of the different designs that are posted on here, trail engineers, surveyors, and commercial mine technicians all these need these massive spacesuits. And there's even special weapons shown, like the an Anatomical Environment Multi-Tool, or AEM, which was made to shoot spikes into walls in order to hoist the walls of the cave so you can walk through it, but they later realized was really, really good at taking out these giant lobster things that attack the workers. So you may be asking all these workers, all these miners, like understandably it's a park, but what are they looking for? And the answer is, all sorts of stuff. Like using chemicals and enzymes found within the cave, Anodyne became this multi-conglomerate corporation that made things from laundry cleaner over to powerful computers that use the nerve fibers of the cave walls as a means of processing information. And things like Coat Heartthrob, which is a special flavor of coke that has some very special abilities. As the description reads on that, it says Coke Heartthrob was first introduced on Valentine's Day in 1985 as a limited promotion, but sold so well over the summer that Coca-Cola added it to their primary beverage roster in 1986. The defining ingredient in Coke Heartthrob was, of course, amniotic ballast, harvested from special glands deep within the mystery flesh pit. The potent aphrodisiacal properties of amniotic ballast were diminished by heavily diluting the chemical before adding it to the beverage, but Coke Heartthrob still developed a notorious reputation for its unusual intoxicating effects. So remember earlier how I said there's the amniotic pools that we're gonna mention later? This is the part where I mentioned them. So hidden deep within the cave, they found something that they believe is a part of the creature's endocrine system known as the amniotic thermal springs. And it turns out these things have insane healing properties. We see images of how this is used as a treatment for Alzheimer's or better aging in the elderly, as well as being used for cancer treatment and all sorts of different illnesses. There are several spas in and around the pit that use this amniotic ballast as a source of physical healing. On the Mystery Below Journey pamphlet, among all the different lounging and dining options we see, like the Marriott Hotel that they have, or the Hard Rock Cafe located just outside of the pit, and even things like an IMAX theater, we can see the advertisement for the amniotic thermal springs. It says on there, located on the ground floor of the visitor center, by the vending machines are the amniotic baths. 
So this is above surface before you go into the pit. Amniotic secretions are pumped from glands deep within the pit for visitors who are unable to descend into the pit. These springs are known to have a range of positive effects on human psychology, physiology, and well-being, and are enjoyed both medicinally and recreationally. Note, as the visitor center is a family-friendly facility, the surface spring baths are diluted to a 1 to 20 potency ratio with filtered water. For higher concentrations within adult-only baths, park guests are encouraged to visit the pleasure domes located east of the lower visitor center complex within the mystery flesh pit okay so these amniotic things are used as aphrodisiacs in coke and it says here that they are heavily diluted in the park itself because it's a family friendly atmosphere or i should say within the hotel itself in the park they're not diluted at all for those that don't know an aphrodisiac is something that gets you in the mood and if you were curious how effective of an aphrodisiac this stuff is in the chart that shows us details of the amniotic thermal springs itself we can see a spring potency chart now essentially remember this is a giant creature the thermal springs are these glands that you can walk through the canals of and bathe inside of these giant hot tubs essentially made out of enzymes and all the different nodes of this gland act as different bathhouses on the chart for the spring potency you can see that there is a green line and for the green line it says visitors are encouraged to consult a physician before entering baths below the green line because it can have different effects on your well-being and then the yellow line on the super potent baths the most potent of which being the libido bath it says visitors are encouraged to consult a religious mystic or sexual wellness counselor before entering baths below the yellow line because the more potent this stuff is the more in the mood you get it says that outside of the main bath which remember is very very diluted users have to be 18 years old to go into the main baths also because you can't bring any clothing in there you have to be naked because of course you do it even says on this chart a secondary and infamous property of amniotic spring fluid are the psychoactive and aphrodisiacal effects it has on those who consume or topically apply it bathers describe a gentle euphoric sensation when soaking in higher potency springs with the effects of concentrated exposure being well documented by several best-selling short films, short films, many of which are available for purchase by request in the Upper Visitor Center gift shop, beyond the physical sensations, visitors often claim that they develop deep emotional bonds with those they interact with while inside the thermal springs. <laughs> So you go inside the like nodes of this giant monster thing underground and fall in love, which is a story as old as time. Also, looking at this chart, I just noticed a bottle of water is $13 down here. Oh my gosh, that is price gouging. <laughs> That's the real horror of this whole thing. These horrible amusement park level gouging, my word. Anyway, also uh, looking at this node chart, um, there is a small sort of squishy node that comes off to the side and it says undeveloped ballast bulb visitors are encouraged to experience the traditional bathing process by crawling into the bulb orifice uh, no thank you and then over to the side we can see pumps that work as a way of pumping this amniotic fluid to the surface. What's interesting is reading the final paragraph of this entire chart, it says amniotic spring fluid is safe to eat and drink and has enjoyed limited exposure as an additive to a variety of popular consumer foodstuffs, such as the seasonally available Coca-Cola heartthrob, Feel Good McFlurry, and even a ballast-based cordial liquor. And if you'll remember what I talked about at the beginning, this is a since-shut-down national 
Central Park, and it was shut down over a specific event that happened that we're going to talk about in a minute. Now, several may be curious as to what the actual layout of the park is. As far as the hiking routes go, it says several of the different routes you can go on. For example, the Bowels of the Earth route, it says the basic tour through the Mystery Flesh Pit. It is a 7.85 mile self-guiding stroll through many large and famous features like the Thor's Rib Cage, Septum Falls, God's Mistake, and Oyster's Shame. Then there's some more adventurous ones you can go on. There's some guided ones by a ranger that you have to go through where you pretty much have to crawl through these really tight like blood vessel things which uh. also in the description for one of those tours known as the swallowed hole tour it says note this tour is not recommended to those who suffer from claustrophobia or a fear of being eaten alive also known as those with common sense what's also interesting that you can find while looking through this is several of the park signs that are shown like for example this one that says notice respiratory mucosal folds are unmarked exercise caution to avoid entrapment because you can walk into the cilia of one of these things and get absorbed now if you were to be absorbed what might happen to you and I assure you now the answer is not good see on the identifying wildlife pamphlet earlier there was one specific creature called compound surface fauna and the description says on rare occasions abyssal soap whatever that word is and other park wildlife will venture outside of the pit and will per pull surface animals such as deer livestock coyotes and rabbits into the mystery flesh pit if not eaten by park fauna these animals may undergo a fascinating phenomenon known as anatomical amalgamation this process which is not fully understood by park scientists results in the creation of a compound organism which is a hybrid of constituent surface animals no two of these amalgamations are the same though the resulting physiology often results in similar conditions such as partial fusing of major body elements and relocation of internal organs to locations on the exterior of the body because of the gruesome and seemingly haphazard nature of the combinations, many compound surface fauna do not live beyond a few hours or days from the time they are discovered. Should you encounter a shambling compound surface fauna, please do not feed it or otherwise engage in activity which could prolong its suffering. And then the most terrifying note in red at the bottom, in the extremely unlikely event that you encounter an amalgamation containing one or more human constituent organisms contact a park ranger immediately via one of the emergency telephones installed along trail routes and in horrific images like this and descriptions around it we can see what happened to those people it says while hipaa and similar regulations prevent me from finding out exactly how many people even suffered amalgamation it's estimated that fewer than half a dozen ever survived the treatment process to recovery recovery though is a loaded word here the treatment co-developed by Baylor Medical Center and Anodyne Corporation was highly dependent on the nature of the amalgamation and seems to have been most successful with combined masses containing only human tissue. The procedure for treatment involved removing the brain and as much of the spinal cord as possible from the amalgamation. When possible, extraction of other organs such as eyes, cochlear tissue, tongues, and larynx would later enable the recovered patient a sensory experience much closer to that which they had previously enjoyed, since medical technology is even still unable to replicate the organic sensory quality of human sensory tissues. However, the difficulty and cost of this additional procedure all but ensured that this rarely took place. Once extracted, the brain of the individual patient would be placed in a nutrient salve, so whatever, and connected to a proprietary interface and life support system developed by Anodyne Company. A rudimentary, computer-based system could be used to communicate with the recovered patient after several months of therapy, and in some cases, individuals were reported able to use vocoders to synthesize speech. It is unknown how many, if any, of these individuals are still living today. So most likely through the cilia in the wall that it said do not get stuck into, you get mushed together with a bunch of other stuff that also got stuck in the walls and become these blob creatures that they try to harvest some 
organs from to keep you kind of alive. I hate it here. But those visitors that still decide to go in, go in through this massive elevator into a central thing called the Lower Visitor Center located in the essentially throat of this creature. And as you can see from this image, it is a huge multi-level shopping mall with vendors and gift shops and restaurants and everything else you could imagine. In the description for it, it says, Your adventure into the wonder and magnificence of the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park begins as your enclosed gondola begins to descend down into the darkness, away from the blistering heat and light of the Permian Basin. Just when the 20-minute twisting and turning ride down into the maw of this immense organism feels like it might never end, an illuminated structure comes into view beneath your feet. Step out of the elevator car and into the well-lit and comfortable lobby of the Lower Visitor Center, your gateway to an unforgettable visit to one of the world's most unique natural wonders. So this thing is so far down there, it takes 20 minutes on an elevator to get to a like, eight story shopping mall. And if you look back at the maps of this entire thing, that is still nothing compared to the full size of this creature. What is interesting is that in several of the supplemental materials, you can find audio like this that shows what noise is played whenever you make it to the visitor center. Hello, welcome to the lower visitor center. Here you can start your incredible otherworldly adventures with our child friendly tours. For the daring thrill seeker, sign up for private expedition orientation classes at the front desk. For other questions, feel free to ask any of our park rangers. Remember, adventure awaits in the underground. Also inside of these restaurants in the lower visitor center, for a long time it was said that they served meat from the cave wall itself, which is gross. However, in one of the Q&As um, that the creator did, he said that this is not true. However, people have ate the meat and says it tastes too gamey to serve, but <laughs> that the giant lobster things taste delicious. <sighs> and I've also talked at length already about the Amniotic Springs, also known as the pleasure domes but another superstructure that you come across which is actually at the furthest traced or at least mapped out point in the pits is the intra park wellness resort this is essentially a giant resort or ski lodge type thing that is built onto the walls of what is basically the stomach of this creature overlooking something called the greater gastric sea which remember everything in the pits like dark so you can't see forever but as far as the people can see it is a endless sea of bile and stomach juices and this resort has pretty much everything from beauty shops convenience shops a comedy depot an arcade system a techno bis which wait what a dance club it has a dance club because of course it does this entire thing is a monument to man's arrogance <laughs> there's a petting zoo as well where you can pet the declawed lobster creatures anyway and in all the details about the spa treatments and the thermal things you can go to it talks about the controls you can have for your room yourself like a humidity control and also a window cleaning knob because since you are overlooking a sea of gastric juices in your hotel room, they keep popping up on the window so you have these giant wipers to clean it off, which again, disgusting. I should also mention, speaking of humidity, you're inside of a living thing. So anywhere that is not on the main trail where they have constant AC systems running is 98.6 degrees and 100% humidity, so miserable. Which is something a lot of the miners talked about having to deal with, the constant heat and pressure being inside of this thing, because you're essentially a foreign pathogen inside of a giant body. So it's absolutely unbearable if you're not in one of the park designated areas. And even then you could still get killed by the lobster creature, so just don't do it. 
One of the last details of the actual park layout that I want to mention, besides the fact that if you're not thinking about already, everywhere through the park has to be held open with stents so that the muscles or systems don't close back around you, is the emergency telephones that are placed throughout several different points in the park. Like on this poster, you can see that there are these phones placed around that were done by AT&T, and in the description, it describes that 150 miles of cable were laid as a means of getting communications outside of this organism. Also, seasoned hikers and park field staff referred to these as lighthouses, as walking through the dark with your flashlight, you would see these random blue phones while walking along your path. Which, with all of these, I want you to imagine like the flesh and the noises and just the fact you're walking through something's giant body system and to just be walking through such an alien place and come across a blue telephone box is so cosmically terrifying. I love it so much. Another thing to mention is public reaction to the pit itself. And as we can see through several images, the town of Gumption, Texas that the pit is located in absolutely loved the tourism and capitalized on it. However, some were not so happy about it. For example, an advertisement that was hung on hotel doors within the pit is an ad for someone called Homer Litfer Butcher, who works as an attorney for people who were injured while in the flesh pit. And as we can see on an April 1981 issue of Sanctified, the magazine of the Southern Baptist Association, it says on the cover, Baptist Convention denounces exploration of mystery flesh pit, calls it a foul tunnel to Lucifer himself buried by the almighty, enjoyed by the dam. And then in a very interesting picture, we can see a image of Dante's Inferno comparing the pit itself to the mouth of hell, which is really cool. And I think I agree with the church on this one. <laughs> There's also three Q and A's, or at least three so far that Trevor has done to explain people's questions about the entire world of Flesh Pit National Park. And one of the questions that he was asked is how long could someone live in the flesh pit long term, to which he said, archaeological evidence of prehistoric human activity within the pit has led to conjecture among scientists that long-term habitation within the anatomy of the pit is possible, but unlikely. Without modern technology and tools, any humans living long-term within the entrails of the superorganism would need to adapt to the perpetual darkness, subpar oxygen, constant high humidity heat, and continually changing fleshscape in order to survive. Fleshscape is a fantastic word, oh my gosh. <laughs> Over hundreds of generations, when combined with poorly understood long-term effects of consuming amniotic ballast fluid, it is entirely possible that humans adapt to this lifestyle would be fundamentally different from modern humans. Or in other words, if people lived long-term down there, they would probably adapt into these amorphous creatures like the other things that are down there, which who's to say some of that stuff down there isn't people, but whatever. A couple things that I can't find exactly where it was mentioned because I've read through so many of these pamphlets and I can't remember where everything was, but while first exploring the pit, they came across armor from around the period of the Spanish Inquisition, which implies that people got there way earlier, or at the very least they were dragged underground by the things that were there. And one of the more interesting things said in one of these Q&As is someone asked the question, are there any Jumanos, Apache, or Comanche, the American Indian people native to the surrounding area, folk tales or oral histories concerning the superorganism. To which Trevor answers, there is a fascinating legend from the near Cado people by the name of Sacred Medicine Water, which I will reproduce here. The favor of the Great Spirit rested on the abundant forest, flowers, songbirds, and small animals of these quiet hills. Then a fierce dragon devastated the land, bringing disease and hunger and hatred and greed on the people. The Indian nations pleaded with the Great Spirit to subdue the dragon into a deep slumber, and the night of all the heavenly forces contrived to bury it under the world, where it shakes the earth even today. Once the Great Spirit had vanquished the dragon, he caused pure water to gush up through the earth from the beast and asked that his favorite place be held neutral ground 
so all can share in the healing waters. So here we see this dragon mentioned in Native American folklore is the thing that got knocked out and buried underground. Because if you remember, this thing was completely underground until the oil man Jim Jackson found it in 1973. And these healing waters that it mentions the people would drink that came up from the ground after the dragon was put to sleep are quite possibly the amniotic fluids that we have found in the current day have healing properties. So, if this creature was knocked into a deep slumber, then we better hope it never wakes up. Which, it definitely did, and that would be the situation that led to the shutdown of the park in the 2007 catastrophe. Now, the incident is hinted at several times in different stories or images, I should say, we come across because Everything that's shown, all the brochures, are relics of the now shut down park being put together by this creator online. That is, until we get to the official US Commission on Geobiological Resource and Public Safety who did a final incident report on what happened to the park. In the executive summary, they say, at 9.41 p.m. Central Standard Time on July the 4th of 2007, the Permian Basin Superorganism Natural Preserve, known colloquially as Mystery Flesh Pit National Park, experienced a catastrophic disaster which resulted in over 750 fatalities and over 1,800 major injuries. In the weeks following the incident, approximately 18,000 individuals from the surrounding communities sought medical and psychological treatment for ailments including breathing problems, chest pains, shortness of breath, nausea, birth defects, hallucinations, depression, anxiety, internal bleeding, sore throat, and headaches as a direct result of contact with gastric ejecta which had been introduced to the atmosphere. Investigators have concluded that this disaster was chiefly characterized by a premature geobiological consumption event caused by the catastrophic failure of critical park infrastructure to constrain and limit the gastric, motor, and neurological actions of the Permian Basin superorganism. Investigators have included that the failure of these critical safety measures are the direct result of negligent practices by the primary site operating contractor Anodyne Deep Earth Mining, a subsidiary of Anodyne Incorporated. So essentially, they are saying that 750 people died and a whole lot more were injured because of negligence on Anodyne's part. And then it goes by a step-by-step -step collection of what exactly happened on the night of July the 4th, 2007. And we are going to go through that report now. So start of relevant timeline. At 1029 AM on July the 4th, unreasonably high rains forced park administrators to cancel a July 4th concert and fireworks display scheduled to take place on the surface park grounds. Many visitors who had already purchased tickets to the event become upset and a decision is made to extend the park hours until midnight for those who had purchased event tickets. And that was their first mistake. 8 p.m. Normal closing time for the national park. A typical shift change of reduced night staff in the control room takes place. 9.16 p.m. Harvesting crews working in the western extremities of the organism set a new extraction record to meet a quota for bonuses in time for the holiday weekend. 9.30 p.m. Control room operators initiate a routine system self-test and discover a relay fault error resulting from increased electrical demand from mining equipment and tourist infrastructure, a control room operator logs the fault and notifies an on-duty engineer. Basically because they were running over shift and because on another end of the park they were trying to mine really fast, the electronics became overwhelmed. 9.41 p.m. Water drainage from surface rain into the entry orifice begins to collect in the sand gullet. Drainage pumps are automatically activated by a sensor system but fail to initialize due to the relay fault. An emergency backup pump running on a separate emergency circuit is automatically activated. 9.42 p.m. A critical alarm in the control room alerts operators that the emergency water pump has ceased and is inoperative. 
Under lubrication of the pump's impeller bushings resulted in corrosion due to the moist interior of the flesh pit environment. Because yeah, if you've got all this equipment inside something as humid as a living, breathing organism, stuff's gonna rust. 9.48 p.m. Technicians arrive at the primary pump station to discover the sand gullet almost completely submerged. Water begins to pour over the dorsal respiratory ridge and into bronchial bulb bulbules. Control room operators divert power to hydraulic stent rams to brace for expected choke response. So essentially, normally, water goes down into a first little dip inside of the throat and pumps move it out, but because the pumps are not working because they're rusted, the water keeps pouring and it's now pouring into the lungs of this thing. Which again, this has never been a problem for hundreds if not thousands of years because it was all underground, but because we had to go do wop and then blow the lid off of it and then build an entire amusement park inside of this thing's mouth, um, it's causing problems. So all of those giant rods that are placed inside of it to keep the throat open all double down and brace because if this thing coughs, um, it's going to be really bad. 951. Technicians A repair the relay stuff as control staff reset the park's electrical grid. The grid is offline for 45 seconds. The automatic PA system does not notify guests as the system is scheduled to automatically shut down at the normal 8pm closing time. The temporary lapse of lighting causes many guests to become panicked and return to the main gantry lift at the lower visitor center. So the park's supposed to be shut down and because it's supposed to be shut down, no one is told by the PA system that all the lights are gonna go off. So once it's blackout, people panic and start running for the elevator. 9.52 PM, a choking action from the organism begins 31 seconds into the electrical reset. The main dorsal trunk violently flexes Lack of power to hydraulic arming rams causes irreparable damage to several sections of internal infrastructure. So when this thing had a little cough, it crushed everything. In certain parts. We'll get to what happened to the parts with the people in it in a second. 953. As the electrical system finishes the reboot cycle, the dynamic hydraulic actuator supporting the lower visitor center overcorrect for stability not accounting for the shift in the wall lining of the nexial cavity in which the visitor center facility is anchored. Two of the six structural supports are torn from their foundation, which causes the facility to list 20 degrees off vertical. The base joint of the vertical entry gantry is bent beyond its design limit angle. So the giant eight story shopping mall gets broken a bit and does this, and now everyone's fallen over and now you can't get out. 954. The master alarm is tripped automatically. Surface facilities are notified as response teams are given the orders to mobilize. 956. Park rangers are dispatched to rescue groups of visitors trapped in partially collapsed tunnels and trails. 1003. Continued movement of the organism combined with rainwater causes one of the upper entry gantry supports to slip. An outbound elevator conducts an emergency stop stranding over two dozen visitors. 1005, tremors registered as far away as the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. So this thing starting to cough and move is causing massive earthquakes across the state of Texas. 1006, 1006, soil liquefaction destabilizes surface facilities in and around the organism. Dilation anchors begin retracting to keep the entry orifice open. So now this thing is trying to shut its mouth. 1012, the master failsafe is activated by the automated park management system. 20,000 liters of acinetin compound are injected into the superorganism via a distributed network of relay stations located through its known internal anatomy. So essentially now they're trying to drug this thing. 1012, tremors and convulsions intensify as the entry gantry connection to the lower visitor center detaches completely. The lower visitor center begins to collapse downward into the nexial cavity. So that entire thing full of hundreds of people just starts falling deeper into the creature's stomach. 1012, peristaltic muscle action of the nexial cavity begins to exert substantial pressure on the outer structure of the lower visitor center facility. 1015, 
the prime Layboid junction just west of the Septum Falls geobiological feature flexes into an open position, releasing a torrent of lagogastric chyma into the dorsal trunk. It is likely that this was the reaction to the acinanin injection. So essentially, because they tried to drug this thing, it started to throw up. 1016. Peristaltic spasms force the caustic chyma slurry through the nexial cavity and up through the lower and upper moisture crops towards the surface, surface orifice. Surface orifice. Surface orifice. Okay. 1016. Many guests attempting to flee the stalled elevator near the entry orifice attempt climbing out of the upper moisture crop, but are ultimately unsuccessful due to torrential rains causing the surface to become very slippery many end up falling back into the maw now it's a sarlacc pit people are literally trying to like crawl out the sides and keep slipping back into the mouth 1017 the chyma slurry erupts from the surface orifice in a geyser several hundred meters in height large pieces of undigested organic matter crush several vehicles and damage windows so at this point it's thrown up meaning anyone who was still inside of this super acidic acid when it got shot out um is well i mean they're out now but they're also melting <laughs> 1019 following the several minute long ejecta event a deep and incredibly loud roar erupts from the entry orifice as ground tremors intensify further. Large extremities begin surfacing through bedrock and soil approximately 30 to 120 kilometers from the entry orifice. So now other parts of this thing are shooting above the ground up to around 100 miles away from the mouth. 1025, the acid smell of the gastric ejection can be detected as far as Odessa, Texas. 1026, two park service vehicles and a tour vehicle containing park service employees and several guests attempt to ascend through the entry orifice tube. Because remember, way, way down in there and past different from the stomach, there were still these truckloads full of people. 1027, Peristaltic action crushes one of the tour vehicles and sucks the other two vehicles back into the nexial cavity and down into a digestive organ. These vehicles are presumed destroyed. So as they're trying to get out, it essentially swallows them because now all the inside structures are broken and it's starting to actually move its body. 1058. The Pentagon is given authorization from the White House to use nuclear force if necessary to prevent the organism from entering an active and or ambulatory state, which I'm not really sure that'd do anything, but okay. 1102, the on-site operations director within the lower visitor center control room, so he's down there being crushed by the gullet, initiates a final failsafe measure in the form of the contingency measure. 1102, Master Event Log records successful spin-up of the contingency measure. So we don't know, and we're not going to know specifically what this contingency measure is, but I have a theory I'll talk about near the end. 1105, Lower Visitor Center structure integrity is critically compromised, resulting in total collapse, meaning everyone in that Lower Visitor Center, including the operator who gave the contingency order, were killed by the crushing. 1105, data connection with Lower Visitor Center is severed, because yeah, it got crushed. 1113, spasms and motor action of the superorganism begin to noticeably subside. Response teams begin to descend into the surface orifice to attempt rescue operations. 1119, Response team encounters visitor group which had attempted escape from stalled elevator. Most are dead, the remainder are mortally wounded and partially digested due to the caustic gastric ejecta. Uh, so it's just an elevator full of melting people. Ugh. 1142. Radio contact estab- and also when I say uh, I mean like a cool uh, cause this is awesome. <laughs> Radio contact established with ranger vehicle trapped within oyster shame. Due to ventricular closure, ventricle closure, no feasible rescue strategy can be developed before complete mastication occurs. 1156, response team confirms that contingency measure and associate facility are still intact and operating. 1158, Texas Governor Rick Perry formally declares a state of emergency for Gumption County. 1222, 
response teams route data and power umbilical to new base camp in the contingency measure facility. 1235, three interpit life forms are identified as having been ejected onto the surface. 15 visitors are injured and seven are hunted by interpit life forms during panicked evacuation of surface resort. So some of the people who were just on land and around are now being killed by the giant crab things that got shot onto the surface. 1241 park staff managed to kill the three large life forms. 102. National Guard helicopters begin delivering supplies and personnel to aid in site containment. 158. Field hospital is constructed to care for wounded visitors and staff. 237. Initial damage surveys report catastrophic destruction of internal park infrastructure. Pit geobiology has dramatically changed in hazard level. 3 a.m. Emergency teleconference of Anodyne Executive Leadership, National Parks Director, and Security of the Interior are present. 312, executive decision is made to initiate FEMA response and assemble a task force for containing superorganism. 4. Media helicopters and vehicles begin to report on scope of disaster. 439, base camp technicians begin to spin down contingency measure. Large fractures due to internal stretch have appeared on mineral components. Engineers advise against reinitializing contingency measure until mineral components can be replaced and repaired. 608. Ground personnel begin assembling a pump system to inject industrial sedatives into the superorganism. Transport trucks containing industrial sedative arrive. 945. Emergency teleconference of anodyne shareholders. 1120. Several injured visitors inexplicably leave field hospital and begin walking begin walking towards open pit orifice. Approximately 38 individuals are able to crawl back into the orifice over the course of eight hours. None are recovered. 3.51 p.m. Radio transmission from the trapped ranger vehicle ceases. Many speculate that other small groups of visitors and staff are still trapped and that's the end of the relevant timeline. So a few things to note here. <laughs> Essentially, all of these people died and all of this occurred because the creature coughed and moved its arm a bit to give you a scope of how huge this thing is. So if it's not clear, I'm pretty sure what's going on is there's several supernatural things happening just below the surface. The number one being the contingency measure. See, if you look on the map of the above ground section, there is a side place that is a ritual site. And apparently it was a ritual for the natives who would perform these sort of ceremonies in honor of this great being. Or, in order to keep it down one way or the other. And on this device pictured in which we can see what the contingency measure device looks like, it operates off some sort of mineral that they said became compromised while they were performing it. And obviously whatever the contingency measure was, it worked because only 13 minutes later, the creature went back to sleep. I think that this rock that is placed inside of this device in order to make this thing go back to sleep is an ancient relic of whatever this great spirit is that put this dragon underground. So the contingency measure itself is essentially worshiping it the way that the natives used to and that or alternatively worshiping the spirit that fights the dragon and therefore forcing it to go back to sleep. And this dragon itself, or at least that's as it's described in the old legends, has a sort of hold on the people that were in it, which is why 38 people who barely escaped with their lives crawled back into the mouth of this thing. I also want to mention the terrifying fact that transmission didn't cease with the one car that was cut off by a closed up mouth or essentially tubule of this thing. Um, that probably still survived and either died of starvation or were eaten by the creatures down there or something because they were on the radio for like 14 hours and then went out and then it says they never got them out, which who knows how they went. And at the end of this entire thing, the report essentially says that it's Adonine's fault that any of this ever happened and the company shut down shortly afterwards and went bankrupt because, you know, public opinion wasn't exactly great after this. And as far as that limb that raised above the ground, this is what that looked like. A hundred miles away, this giant thing that shot miles and miles into the air is just maybe a shoulder or an arm or even a finger of whatever this creature is. I also want to mention to further back up my theory about the contingency plan being a sort of religious or ceremonial kind of thing. 
In the Q&A, someone asked rumors of religious facilities built within the pit, and in the answer, Trevor says, I don't have many details on it, but the contingency measure facility referenced in the, in the 2007, 2007 disaster overview report was designated as an ecclesiastical religious observance facility in a 1998 GSA construction budget report. Make of that what you will. So absolutely, whatever this contingency report is, it's something spiritual and whatever it is, it worked. Also on a chart that shows you signs of the Mystery Flesh National Park, and one of them that you can see in 1973, it says ecclesiastical personnel proceed to ritual site encampment. So even in 73, when they were putting this together, they realized there was some ritual practice that went into it. And then if you look at the modern signage that is up, it is a 10,000 volt electric fence that says attention, extreme danger, stop, this area has been quarantined for your safety. Fact, over 582 people have died attempting to commune with the superorganism. Fact, the US government is unable to rescue individuals trapped by the superorganism. Fact, you will not receive a gift from the superorganism. And fact, you will find no answers beyond this fence. There is nothing beyond this fence worth dying for. So that whole idea that they have to put up signs saying there's no answers past this and you won't find out anything more, goes to say that there has to be at least some people around the area who think the pit holds these special or spiritual properties. And now the pit essentially works as a derelict left behind establishment of what it once was with large companies existing that are owned by the government and there's absolutely no current day records of what they're doing but it's something they call the reclamation so what some may think is essentially getting back their resources is probably actually another corporate way of trying to get resources out of the pit which i'm sure won't go wrong Ever. But the 2007 event and the fact that all of it got shut down over it is the reason the entire presentation of everything that you read on the website is of a now defunct park because it has been shut down and has just been used as a sort of scavenging project since. And the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park is now a monument to man's arrogance and exists as a sort of forgotten memory only mainly remembered by the many, many dead that are a symptom of man trying to enter themselves into something that they don't fully understand. And as a quick little tangent off of that, would this not make the best survival horror video game ever? Like, I mean ever. Every single second of the setting is fantastic. You have all of the possible vehicles that the player could use mapped out and in stuff that I didn't really get into, describe how it works. You have an evil company that is trying to gather resources from it even though it's supposed to be defunct. You have a very long list of different enemy types, some of them these giant bugs and some of them these amorphous blogs that can attack you. You have all the different weapons laid out for you, it talks about people use guns but that the giant laser bolt shooter guns are the best and like there's so much you could do with it you even have save points you have these blue lit phones known as lighthouses throughout the entire map that and you got a map <laughs> that's mapped out for you that you could use as save points and then you have all the suits and you have the different character models and like you even have a plot you have the plot of the event that happened and now they're sending in agents on top secret mission missions to reclaim stuff and you have this whole underlying thing of like spiritual ritual and oh my gosh this would be so cool <laughs> it blows my mind that to the best of my knowledge this is the first youtube video ever talking about this thing because this is one of the coolest Lovecraftian, super absurd, cosmic horror pieces I've ever heard of, and it needs more attention. And if this thing, like, if he doesn't make like a book, I think he has a book in the works, but like, if if he, if he needs like a narrative, let me at this. I want to write something for this, or like, like get it to a video game developer. I don't know. This is so cool. I want to see more done with it. Trevor really has something special on his hands. And like, not just from everything that I talked about, but I like, I say this a lot in videos, but I really mean it. Please go to the original website, not only to support him through either his Patreon, or he even has a really cool merch shop that's like Mystery Flesh Na Pit National Park, like hats and hoodies and t-shirts. But like, 
there i i barely touched the surface there are there's information about anodyne there's information about how details of it work there's this long uh science article that talks about how the infrastructure works and how the pipelines work and the architecture that went into the pit and like he's done so much and there's so much fantastic content here and if this interests you even a little bit and even if you don't read i don't care <laughs> It's so good, please check this out. It's worth your time. If you can't tell at this point, I'm a big fan. And I didn't even read all the letters. I didn't read all the propaganda that they did as a means of explaining what the park is or through the Cooper cave guy who like talks about how creepy the pit is, but why kids don't need to be afraid. I didn't read all the letters. I didn't even read the newspaper article that explains who Jim Jackson is. What I did is hit the highlights so you could have a basic narrative understanding that I did not have going into this, which I personally found as being fun not knowing going into this because then I had to put it together myself. But now you can check it out for yourself, get a better understanding of the artwork, the lore, and all the supplemental materials that go into this because this thing is still going on and Trevor is still adding new bits to the lore and making new artwork and this is an incredibly talented and fantastic work and once again i'm telling you if you like this even a little bit check it out it's worth your time but regardless of all that um i guess if you stuck around this long i have no idea how long this video is going to be but if you stuck around to this long i guess you enjoyed it so as always thank you for watching and i'm glad that you enjoyed um this is so fun to me. <laughs> this, this has got to be like one of my favorite kinds of videos to make. Just finding this totally absurd out there concept and then being able to do it. And it blows my mind that there's no videos on this. Like as crazy and as in-depth as this world is, as far as I know, I'm the first guy to talk about it on YouTube, which I am honored for one, but like this thing needs more attention. So hopefully I can bring attention towards it because like, man this this is one of those like rare finds that you come across all the stuff and like i'm scrolling through it right now looking at all this insane artwork and time that went into this and it like it's really something special and like i'm sure a lot of you probably clicked on this video besides my subs who click on everything i do i love you all to death um, but like there's people who clicked on this video just because the title's so eye-catching and yeah it is it the flesh pit national park it's just so cool and it's so fantastic. Um, I, I, I'm really excited because I feel like I'm on the ground floor of something and I hope it is the ground floor. I hope that he's able to just take this and keep rolling with it because this is really good stuff and I love it. Uh, and I feel, I feel kind of honored, honestly, to be the one to talk about it, uh, but it's really cool. So thank you all so much for watching. Uh, this was actually sent to me originally by a Twitter user. Um, Aiden, I forget his exact at. On Twitter, I'll like tweet his at whenever it comes out. But he uh, DM'd me this saying I need to check it out. He was 100% right. So I do check my DMs for like video requests and stuff like that. So if you've got one, please send it. I can't promise to look at all of them, but I can promise to try. Um, so thank you, Aiden, for sending me this. And thank you to everyone for watching this. Um, this has been fantastic. Uh, we are now around 430,000 subs, which is over the moon insane um and i really can't believe it but thank you all so much for that thank you all for getting me to where i'm at um it, it's just hard to take in and uh if, the fact that there's some people watching me just ramble right now is so cool to me but thank you all so much for that thank you so much uh to all of my viewers and subscribers thank you to my patrons and my top tier patrons that you can see here you guys are the best and you keep me going and it means the most so i'm going to go ahead and stop rambling uh, that should be the end of it. I don't think there's any more announcements. There will be m more Iceberg videos on the way. And that should do it. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. And I will see you in the next one.